Can you hear me, Patricia? Okay. Hello, everybody. My name is Susan Gillis. I'm the curator of the Boca Raton Historical Society Museum. And I want to welcome you to our virtual lecture series, Boca History 101. Uh, we have muted your microphone, so please don't unmute and don't join with a uh, computer video because we are recording this and we're going to provide you with a link to the recording to any of our um, people who have signed up for the series. Today, we will be talking about the Florida land boom of the 1920s, Boca Raton and Addison Meisner. And heads up, I am going to go over my half hour limit by a little bit today. Goodness. As I mentioned in previous talks, um, we know the term Boca del Retones was a navigational term for a rocky or a jagged inlet. But the original site of Boca Ratones was actually on Biscayne Bay near Miami Beach, Miami. And somehow the name got associated with our Lake Boca Raton uh, in the early 19th century. So our place name is really just a map maker's error. The town of Boca Raton was uh, platted in 1896 on Mr. Flagler's new Florida East Coast Railway. And for the next couple of decades, it really was just a small farming town. So that all changed during the Florida land boom of the 1920s. So the 20s was a time of economic prosperity in our country, a time of great social change, um, and um, also a time of a good roads movement. Um, there are a lot of new roads being built to accommodate automobiles, which um, were more and more reasonable and more accessible to uh, ordinary folks, not just the wealthy. So people were looking for a get rich quick investment scheme in the 20s. And what better place to invest your money than in Florida, a land loaded with beaches for, uh, for the tourists. And so the land boom was like a Klondike gold rush. Um, I've heard it described as an era of wonderful nonsense. It must have been wonderful to be a Florida property owner at the time. Now I have a few statistics that illustrate this and they're from Fort Lauderdale. I know you'll forgive me because I used to be a, a, a work at the Fort Lauderdale Historical Society. But Fort Lauderdale was a bigger community, but this too, this is a metaphor for cities all over. Uh, the state of Florida at the time. In 1920 in Fort Lauderdale, there were about 2,000 residents. By 26, there were 16,000, 6,000 of whom were licensed real estate brokers. And of course, everybody else was an unlicensed real estate broker. Lots in Progresso, and that's just north of downtown um, near Sunrise and Andrews area, sold for $100 in 22, and three years later, as much as 2,000. Choice downtown properties sold for up to 5,000% of the original price. And investors would buy with 10 or 15% down, having no expectation of paying the full amount for property. They were going to turn over the contract in a week, a month, and make money. So the contracts became known as binders, and the investors were known as binder boys. So into this setting comes this fellow, Addison Meisner. Uh, and he did not invent or create Boca Raton, but there is no question he put her on the proverbial map. We love to name things after him even today. And in the next couple of lectures, we're going to investigate why that is. So of all the places in town named for Addison, uh, the Addison Preserve, Meisner Park, Meisner Park Park, um, Addison never saw any of these things with one very important exception, which we'll speak about in a few minutes. Now, there's a lot of baloney uh, written out there um, about Boca Raton, the Boca Raton Project, and Addison Meisner. And it has been repeated in thousands of newspaper and magazine articles, uh, not to mention on the internet uh, and in his Stephen Sondheim musical. 
Uh, so I like to draw your attention to sources which I consider to be the culprits of these stories. At upper left, we have the legendary Meisner's. Now, this originally appeared as a series of articles in New Yorker magazine by Alva Johnston. And Johnston was actually a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist. Um, very, very entertaining book, very entertaining um, illustrations. Um, it's lots of fun. But Alice de Lamar, Mr. Meisner's good friend, said he apparently did his research in the bars of Palm Beach. Uh, to the right is a story of Boca Raton by Theodore Pratt. Now, Pratt was a Boca Ratonian. Uh, he was a very successful novelist. A lot of his novels were actually made into Hollywood films. And he too repeats these Meisner stories, plus he adds a few about Mr. Geist, the second owner of the hotel, uh, which are based on hearsay. Uh, and all of these are repeated in this little booklet called Once Upon a Time, which was published in many editions, probably more than these three, by Arvida, which was the longtime owner of the Boca Resort. Uh, now, Dr. Donald Curl, who is no longer with us, uh, was our mentor, our, our um, uh, resident uh, expert on Meisner. He was also the expert on planet Earth of Addison Meisner. And uh, he liked to say that Johnston and Pratt uh, were very good researchers, but they never let the truth get in the way of good story. And a lot of stories in Johnston about Addison are probably about his brother, that taller gentleman there in the picture at right, that's his younger brother, Wilson, who was a rogue, uh, not above pulling a con or two. Um, they both were very clever, uh, witty, urbane gentlemen who everybody would love to have at a dinner party. So what do we know? Let, let's talk about what we do know about Mr. Meisner. California boy, um, always very, very artistic, extremely well-traveled in his life and when it was a lot harder to travel around than it is today. And um, he did not go to architectural school. That was kind of a new idea in the US at the end of the 19th century. He did what many young aspiring architects did before him, he apprenticed under Willis Polk, a San Francisco architect for three years in the late 19th century. So in the 20th century, he spends a decade as a country house architect on Long Island. Uh, meanwhile, his brother Wilson is doing very well, very well known in New York society. They both have really good contacts. And Addison meets Paris Singer. Paris is one of Isaac Singer, the sewing machine guy, many heirs, and is fabulously wealthy. And he and Addison are absolute kindred spirits. They love architecture, they love art, they love beautiful things. So Paris commissions Addison to build a convalescent hospital for returning World War I veterans on the resort island of Palm Beach. Now, Palm Beach re existed as a resort, but it looked very, very different than what it does today. And so Miser designs this Mediterranean palace. And what happens is the war ends before the club is finished. It is no longer needed as a hospital. And instead it becomes the very exclusive private Everglades club, which it is today uh, on the shores of Lake Worth at the uh, west end of Worth Avenue. And this is about 1918. So all the society mavens in Palm Beach say, darling, I must have a cottage by this fellow Addison Meisner. And he becomes the society architect and creator of the Palm Beach style. Now, Medi he did not invent Mediterranean revival architecture. We like to call it Meisner style a lot of times, but it's really Mediterranean revival. Um, he did not invent this style, but he was arguably the most famous certainly today, the best known architect working in this style. So let's look at the style itself. Mediterranean revival. Now, Dr. Curl likes to say, Sue, it's not a revival of anything. I hate that revival word. It's really an American uh, style that has these various influences, Spanish, Italian, Portuguese, Central American, Mission, Pueblo, and Moorish. 
Uh, and I, I want to say here that the first examples of what we call Mediterranean Revival style are actually the two Flagler hotels in St. Augustine built in the 1880s. Uh, and by the 1920s, there are hundreds of architects working in this style in Florida and California and elsewhere, but particularly in Florida and California. Mediterranean Revival usually features some, if not all of these features, balconies, arch windows, wrought iron details, barrel roof tiles, which is a necessity, towers and stuccoed walls. Meisner style in particular featured rambling low roof lines and handmade barrel tiles. He was obsessed with roofs. We have like 50 photographs of the roofs of Venice that he took on a trip there. An eclectic blend of motifs, cast stone, that's cement to us, uh, door and window surrounds, columns and architectural details to look like real stone, restrained decorative details, open floor plans embracing the Florida climate. Remember, no AC back then. Courtyards, stuccoed exterior and interior surfaces, pecky cypress ceilings. Uh, and if you're not familiar, um, the council chamber in town hall has pecky cypress ceilings. Uh, and this is a wood that looks like it was salvaged from some ancient Spanish building. It has uh, holes as if from uh, old uh, beetle larvae, you know, wood boring insects, that kind of thing. Uh, and in fact, it's a product of a fungus in the living wood. So what was formerly considered to be a trash tree, Meisner makes popular, trendy, uh, and new work starts being produced with this uh, pecky cypress, so it looks like reclaimed salvaged lumber. And after 1928, and Pay attention to the date because we're on a very tight time frame in this particular topic. 28, that's after Meisner has left, heads up, uh, Boca Raton project, woodite paneling and ceiling. And woodite is um, a composite material made of uh, plaster Paris, uh, wood shavings, and on the back it looks like a solidified foam because that's what it is. And on the front it looks just like wood. It certainly can fool me. Here's a few of his projects in the Palm Beach area, of course, the beautiful Everglades Club. My favorite stairwell from Villa Flora, El Mirasol, and the magnificent Gulfstream Club, which still stands on A1A in Gulfstream, north of Delray, and looks much as it did when it was originally constructed. Mr. Meisner had a series of workshops in West Palm. Uh, the retail establishments were on, uh, on Via Meisner next to his apartment, which we'll see in a moment. And Meisner Industries produced all the sorts of things one needs to build a Meisner house or a house in the Mediterranean Revival style. And it wasn't just for his use, it was for architects working in the style, the general public. And I liken it to Ikea and Pier 1. Oh, Pier 1 doesn't exist anymore. Uh, but Meisner Industries produced cast stone, roof and floor tiles, decorative pottery, outdoor and indoor furniture, art glass for windows, ironwork, tinwork, and after 1928, wood eye. And also after 1928, uh, he had not one, not two, but three quarries, including one on Wimba Key near Key Largo, producing what's called keystone. Now we might call it core rock because um, that's what it looks like, but it's not. It's really, a, I believe, in lytic limestone. So Meiser Industries had catalogs such as the one you see here. There are three or four known. Uh, there are only four pages. So this is the inside of one of the Meiser Industries catalogs. Now, the Boca Historical Society has a collection of Meiser Industries because of our interest in Meiser and its association. And I've got to tell you that um, everybody likes to send me a picture of um, what they think is a Meisner industry piece uh, because I've spent a number of years researching the topic. And the fact is there's only a few hundred items we can definitely say are Meisner industries. Uh, the reason is, is because they're not marked with the big exception of the ceramic, the decorative pottery, which is stamped Las Manos. 
Uh, and if you have a peak stamp loss monos, I want you to be sure and contact me because we want to photograph that piece for our research purposes. Or better yet, you might like to donate it to the Boca Raton Historical Society. But as far as the other items go, it's very likely they had some kind of paper sticker, maybe like the one at upper right. Um, I read, I had one reference that actually refers to actually a paper label on the back of something. Well, you know, in our climate, that fell off immediately. Uh, so the only way we can determine things or rise our industries is if they appear in the aforementioned catalogs or amongst the series of several hundred photographs that were taken for catalogs that are happened to be in the collections of the Historical Society of Palm Beach County. And years ago, I spent many, many long hours digitizing that collection for our mutual benefit. Now, it happens that the Bocas Buchong Historical Society Museum is the steward of a collection of items from Mr. Meisner's apartment, which is that tower there on the right. It's called Villa Meisner. It's on Via Meisner Worth Avenue. It's still a very, very fine apartment. I've been fortunate enough to visit it in the modern day. Uh, and of course, our favorite items from the apartment are examples of Meisner Industries. So Meisner doing pretty well for himself, but um, Dr. Curl said he thought probably he wanted to be as wealthy as his Palm Beach patrons. Uh, so he decided to get into the popular hobby of the day, which is real estate investment. In 24, he plans Meisner Mile on the strip of oceanfront in Boynton Beach. Well, long story short, he gets into a clash with the locals over beach access. It's very unpleasant. And he abandons the project. But by March of 25, um, Rodman Wanamaker is starting to purchase land in nearby Boca Raton, three miles of oceanfront, about 1,600 acres in southeast Boca for the Meisner Development Corporation. On April 15th of 1925, Meisner announces formally the Boca Raton project, and that's what it's called, Boca Raton. And you can see the board members are pretty impressive. They include a DuPont, a Vanderbilt, Irving Berlin, and Boca Raton becomes arguably the most famous, not to mention infamous, of the Florida boom time developments. We still remember it. Meisner's dream is to create the greatest resort community in the world, the dream city of the Western world. Now, a lot of people are under the misconception because of those articles I mentioned earlier that Boca Raton was somehow fraudulent or a scam, a con. Not true at all. Number one, I've seen the architectural drawings. Uh, but Meisner Development Corporation spent tons of money on infrastructure. Uh, they built roads, they leveled streets, they dredged canals, they brought electrical power, uh, water supply, sewage to, to town. Um, and this is not the action of a shyster con artist because you don't realize any return on your investment in infrastructure unless you go ahead and construct and sell those residences, those commercial buildings. And so the Meisner Development Corporation ads, of which we have approximately 90 full-size newspaper ads, are full of reassurances. Now, more about this in our next lecture. Uh, so you see actualities. We have pictures. We have lists of what's going on. Over 14 million in 14 weeks. Uh, and as Dr. Curl said, while other developers made promises, Meisner strove to build his dream city of red tile roofs. Now here's part of my favorite ad because we can see, and I hope city council members are watching, uh, we can see that people are coming by air, land, and sea to one spot on the entire planet, Boca Raton, Florida. Meisner Development has offices in Palm Beach, Miami, Fort Lauderdale. You could take a bus to Little Boca Raton, um, visit the headquarters, see what the plans were for the development, and see your prospective uh, property. Meisner had uh, plaques um, all over Boca Raton, uh, mostly south of Palmetto Park Road, as you can see in this map. Uh, as a matter of fact, he even had a plaque in Deerfield. Uh, and 
um, we are, this is a view looking east, so the ocean is in the distance there on this flat map. In the foreground um, is the Ritz-Carlton Park, and it was going to be a golf community. And we know that, uh, in fact, the golf course was constructed and played on in 1927. We have articles about it, and we have photographs. They're not very good photographs, but we have photographs. Uh, today, the Ritz-Carlton Park is Sugar Sand Park. And when they were developing Sugar Sand Park, they found irrigation left over from the old golf course infrastructure. So this is a close up of the Miser map because I wanted to show you some other features uh, that survive from that era. Uh, it's kind of fun. Uh, this right here, this is the Amtrak track today. So I-95 is gonna be east of that, right? So when you get off I-95 and head east on Palmetto Park Road, there's a little canal right by Palmetto Park. Um, and it kind of loops back in here near the El Rio. Uh, this is an artifact from the Meisner era. Now, I believe that particularly this loop here uh, probably was a natural waterway because you may recall the El Rio was originally a prong of the Hillsborough River. So it was a natural waterway originally. Uh, but there are vestiges of this running through uh, Royal Oak Hills, basically. Over on the right, this is the city county line, uh, Palm Beach Farms, we call it today. And a lot of the streets still retain their Meisner era Spanish names. Uh, and one of these little parks still survived. Today, it's Pine Breeze Park. So this information from a 1925 ad indicates the scope of Meisner's dream for Boca Raton. It will include a beachfront hotel, a private beach called Meisner Beach, a public beach, a lakefront inn and casino. And remember back then casino just meant meeting place. Um, it was probably going to be a big pool. Multiple golf courses, one for public. Oceanfront homes, villas, lakefront homes, a business area, parks, landscape nurseries, canal front homes, orange groves, a golf club, parking spaces, an aeroplane landing area, and every other feature of modern resort life in tropical Florida. A very grandiose plan. So here's the building that's named for Addison that is, uh, we can justify the name, um, it is the Addison event venue. It used to be the Addison restaurant at Camino Real in Dixie. Originally, this was the Meisner Development Corporation administration buildings. It's actually two, a north and a south building. They were not connected when they were built. Um, and just a reminder, that's Dixie Highway there on the right. And all that white stuff is sugar sand. So, uh, some people think this was a house. It was never a house. It was a dormitory in succeeding years, but originally it was the offices of the sales office, offices of Meisner Development Corporation, as well as home to the surveyors and engineers. Mr. Meisner had an office on the second floor in the south building, the rear, what we think of as the back of the building, uh, and it had the only restaurant in town, which was very successful. And you can see Mr. Meisner there at upper left having a nosh at the restaurant. To your right is a picture of the courtyard back in the day. And we're looking at the south uh, side of the north building. Now you might notice conspicuous by their absence are banyan trees. And I believe based on the photographs we have in our collection, the banyans weren't actually planted until maybe the late 30s. And even though they are very large trees today, I know that banyans can grow, I read up to an acre in size. Uh, so the trees which appear very ancient uh, are in fact babies, baby banyans. So here's some projects that did not happen. A train station for Boca, not for the Florida East Coast Railway, but that other rail line, the Seaboard Air Line, nothing to do with air, that was just its name. And it today is part of Amtrak. So this was going to be a Camino Real by the Amtrak tracks, the CSX tracks. 
Uh, we're very sorry that Castle Meisner, his home, was never built. It was going to be on a spoil island in Lake Oak Raton. There's a huge poster, like a two-page newspaper spread, that has all the details of Castle Meisner, including what color the tiles in the bathroom are going to be. Um, and uh, it had a drawbridge, a boathouse, uh, and it, the article mentions that Meisner was going to leave Castle Meisner to the city of Boca Raton for use as a museum. Wouldn't that be wonderful? And of course, it took 30 more years for Polo to come to town. This is the beautiful Villa, Villa Lucinda, uh, a beachfront home, a house, quote unquote, for Mr. Alexander, a house for Anderson Herb. Look at that stairway on the left, it's wonderful. A winter residence for Madame Alda, who is an opera star, one of his backers. A cabaret ship. Remember, Berlin was his friend. This was going to be a showboat in the middle, moored on Lake Boca Raton. A theater. We're not sure where this was going to be built. The Dunnigan apartments were built. Uh, and they stood on um, a road called DeSoto that ran on the west side of the Cloister Inn. So this is Think of that um, if, you, if you drive into the resort today, you come in um, you know, at the roundabout, come up and then you take that uh, access road on the west side of the hotel to go back to the parking garages. Uh, approximately there is where the Dunnigan apartments were. And we know that it only survived a year or two because by 28, 29, they were demolished in order to expand the Boca Raton Club golf course. More about that later. He designed a series of homes, I guess spec homes, model A, B, C, D, and so on, for Maurice Drucker. And we know that three or four were built smack dab in the middle of what today is Royal Palm Yacht and Country Club. Unfortunately, I have never seen a photograph of any of these, um, and they were demolished in the 1950s. He designed 29 homes in the neighborhood we call Old Forested Today, which is a historic district now. Um, and um, these were one and two story homes. And I'm going to show you a few examples of the architectural drawings for same. Uh, this is house H. Uh, and just a note here, um, often um, the builders would take the uh, plans and reverse them. So you might live in house H reverse, house C reverse, house B, house C. Uh, there were models A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J. House F was never built. And uh, for those of you who live in Old Floresta, Spanish Village, um, I refer you to our website, bocahistory.org. Pull down the research tab, Our History. There's a page devoted to Addison Meisner, and on it you will find links to many uh, Spanish River papers and other publications, including one on Old Floresta, Spanish Village, the Administration Building, the Cloister Inn, and so on, to read more about this topic. He had 22 homes built in what's called Spanish Village, just a few blocks north of the city hall. These are much smaller homes, but they had petty cypress living room ceilings. Very cool. There are 10 or 11 there now. I have to go out and count periodically to see how many survive. Camino Real. Now, everyone in town has heard the legend of Camino Real. And the legend is there was going to be a canal down the center of Camino Real, and you were going to be able to gondola from the um, train station to the hotel. Well, this is, this is not accurate. This is not what the Meisen Development Corporation advertisements say. Uh, that is not what's reflected on the map. And I'll see, there's a, a reason for this confusion. First of all, yes. Uh, Miser Development did plan to build a canal down the center of um, Camino Real, but it was going to be 
west of the El Rio Canal. This is the El Rio right here, okay? And the canal was going to be in sort of the western provinces. So it would not have been navigable, despite the gondola in the picture at the left, which was you know, put in there by the PR marketing department. Um, this is a beautiful painting that's in our collections, commissioned by Meisner Development. So the canal and the boulevard were just going to be pretty. Uh, it was an attraction in the western portions of Boca Raton. And you can see it is clearly inspired by this photograph, which is of the Menge Canal on the Rui Bigonde uh, in Rio de Janeiro, a place that Meisner undoubtedly was familiar with. And he undoubtedly had a copy of this very photograph, which is actually part of a stereoscopic slide. You know, stereoscopes like a Viewmaster. Uh, early 20th century version. Clearly the inspiration for this uh, beautiful painting. In fact, according to the literature, the Camino Real in the eastern portions uh, were, was going to be a broad boulevard wide enough to accommodate 22 lanes of traffic. And this is a photograph, a real photograph, looking west from Federal Highway on Camino Real that is the North Administration Building in the center of the picture and Dixie Highway right next to it. I think the source of the confusion was that people have confused our Florida East Coast Railway Passenger Station with that uh, seaboard station that was never built. I think that's the source of the confusion. Two different things. So his masterpiece was going to be a beachfront hotel the Castillo del Rey, and we have the plans for it. Uh, and it was going to be marvelous. But what happened is very early on, the Ritz-Carlton group gets involved. They said, you know, we love this Boca Raton project. We love this hotel on the beach, but we want to use our own architects. So Meisner says, okay, uh, but he needs a hostelry to accommodate all these prospective investors because there's no place to stay in town very much. Uh, so he quickly designs and has constructed the Ritz Carlson, Carlton Cloister Inn, which opens on the one, uh, western shores of Lake Boca Raton in February of 26. Allegedly, the most expensive 100 room inn built to date. And you can see a photo at lower left that's the west or main or entrance facade. And to your right is the beautiful lakefront facade. This is a picture of a Christmas Eve party at the Cloister Inn with all the right people. This is 1925. Um, here is Addison Meisner and here is Wilson Meisner. And if you look over here, you can see uh, that the um, stucco has not even been applied yet because it's before it's opening. At upper left, we have a picture of the main entrance. Today, this is a part of the Boca Resort and Club that's to your right when you enter the main courtyard. The cloister itself still exists. Back in those days, it was directly on the water, so it was a very beautiful view. Uh, in the 60s, the sea walls were extended, so it's not quite as pretty of a setting. Uh, and of course, fairly recently, glass has been added on the lakefront side of those arches. The cloister garden itself, you can see there's no pretty um, tile work fountains or Shahabar channels or anything like that. That wasn't done till 29 for the Boca Raton Club. Upper left is the original Meisner ballroom. Today, this is three rooms. The Bar Luna, where you can find the original fireplace, those wonderful doors, and on the south side, hiding on the left there, are two beautiful stained glass windows. They used to, of course, look outside. Today, there's a men's room on the other side. So they're backlit and liquor is stored in front of them, but they still exist. The central part of the ballroom is a hall between Palm Patio and the Cloister. The east part of the ballroom is Luca's restaurant. At the upper right is Meisner's dining room not to be confused with the cathedral dining room, a completely different era. Meisner's dining room was divided in half roughly in 1950, 
The top portion with the wonderful arches is the Meisner room, which is on the second floor landing. Uh, the lower floor is three rooms. It's the ice cream store serendipity, the hallway between the palm patio and the grand staircase, and Morimoto Sushi Bar. And that's about to change with the remodeling at the hotel. So you can't tell where you are without a diagram. The lower right is an original Meisner guest room full of Meisner industry pieces. And at the lower left, we have the original Meisner lobby, which is still intact, uh, has not been painted, had the ceiling painted white mercifully. It has beautiful uh, green stained pecky cypress detail. The um, chandelier and the flooring in the Meisner lobby, I believe, are replacements, but they're in the style of. And note that Mr. Meisner used a lot of his personal antiques as well as Meisner industry products to furnish the cloister in because, spoiler alert, he was already running out of money. So this sign would greet you as you drove through town on Dixie. There's federal still under construction. Uh, highway back in 25-26. So this concludes part one of our Meisner talk. Be sure and join us next week when we will have the exciting, uh, sometimes sad, conclusion to Meisner in Boca Raton. Thanks for joining us.